just a, um, I suppose by way of introducing uh, Will, one of the problems we have in our demographic is that people think that, that there's, there's a sort of a big, uh, you know, there's a lot of old people at the Sydney Mining Club, like myself. Um, but what happens is, uh, exactly what happens is that you've got all this bright young stuff and then they get jobs out where we do our business, in the middle of nowhere, and they go absent for 20 years and then they might get a job back in finance and we see them back early and while well, they've got young family living over in somewhere or other in Sydney. And um, so there's a real, there's, there is a bit in the middle that we, um, a sort of a, a, an age gap in the middle that we just naturally through the nature of our business miss out on. Um, Will, um, Will Jeffries, who I, you've probably had chair before, is um, this scruffy fella on the end here. Wouldn't know a tie if it bit, it bit him on the bum. But uh, Will, Will Stunts does, is a great advocate. I want to just say this, a great advocate for our industry. And um, at the ripe old age of um, 24, he's written and produced Alan Jones, Peter Credlin, Mark Burris, and currently Ben Fordham on 2GB. And over the last week, um, he's been instrumental in drawing the attention to the Bowden Silver Mine fiasco, which you've no doubt heard about, and also the McPhillamy's um, uh, cancellation that, that uh, Tanya Plibersek was responsible for, which was just been turned into the greatest violation and confirmed what we've always thought, which, which is that the Labor Party is the natural born enemy of the mining industry. So what Will did was um, he, uh, on, on when the um, so-called landowner at, at uh, McPhillamy's um, made, made this conversation with, with Tanya Plibersek, uh, Will went and got hold of all the actual landowners, the Aboriginal um, uh, groups of that region, and contacted them all and got them on the radio. And they all said, no, we've never heard of this person. You know, who is she? And so Tanya Plibersek, Plibersek has actually gone off and had a secret undisclosed conversation with somebody who, uh, you know, of, of dubious origin, let me say, that's a polite way of putting it. And as Ben Fordham said on the radio, she looked very white. Um, well, if he can say it on the radio, I can say it here, right? I was just quoting it, right? Ben said that. I would never say a thing like that. You know me. I'm very... Yeah, I am really cautious with... Yeah, I am. I'm sure... Propri you know, I've never got into trouble so far. <laughs> anyway, so... So I want to put that edge on the front of it because Sydney Mining Club is, is, is a lot more than about these wonderful projects we, which we've, we've you know, showcased year in, year out now for 26 years and, and also always just presented a, a project every month by January um, consistently for that whole time. But we all, we do stand behind a lot of the current affairs and issues and we do represent and, uh, and with your chairman, uh, uh, tonight, um, Will Jeffries, I just want you to acknowledge that we have a, a great advocate for, it, for our industry. And if you're complaining about too many old buggers around here, well, this, this guy isn't one, and he's doing put it, lifting some some big lift big weights for us. So um, um, that's who that's who he is. And um, um, I look, I probably could roll on and get fired up about things, but I'm not going to because uh, we've got a big big show to get through. And um, if, um, on that note, I just um, I'd say something at the end. I'll give out the presents at the end. I will. How's that sound? Yeah. All right. Please welcome Will Jeffries to the stage. Thanks, Julian. You've uh, stolen half my speech. Uh, but uh, look, before we start tonight, I'd like to acknowledge uh, our sponsors who make these events possible. And we're very grateful to them. And also I'd like to say, you know, at the end of the day, this is your club. Julian's always made that point. And also in my position um, in media, I think the mining sector, you know, any stories, if, any, if there are any companies that are facing difficulties, please reach out. Because at the end of the day, I mean, th this is the industry in Australia and it always has been almost, and it always will be likely. So anything um, that we in the media can do to assist, please.
please, <laughs> I'd love to help because uh, that's our job. Um, now, uh, it's not pretty out there at the moment for the mining sector. We all know that. Uh, Julie mentioned it. Mick Philomies, Tanya Plibersek, Section 10. So Mick Philomies, you had the Independent Planning Commission. You had the New South Wales Environmental Protection Agency. You had the Orange Aboriginal Land Council. They all ticked off in this project. This is a $1 billion project, CapEx, $7 billion of gold on the ground. It's between Orange and Bathurst, Blaney. Everybody in the town supportive. But this woman, Nairi Reynolds, and this was a story that I, 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 I worked on. Um, none of the local Aboriginals have ever heard of this woman. Not one of them. And Tanya Plibersek, the Environment Minister, has over, has ignored all the New South Wales state government bureaucracy. I made this captain's call. It's unbelievable. The Prime Minister, you'd notice, has distanced himself from it. And, yeah, so that was Chris Smins, a New South Wales Premier. And then you've got Bowden's silver mines. Now, that project is now in the Court of Appeal. Well, the Court of Appeal has taken away their planning permit because of a 13-kilometre transmission line. Now, last time I looked at Chris Bowen's energy policy, he wanted to build between 10,000 and 28,000 kilometres of transmission line. I mean, that could get you from the Hunter Valley to Johannesburg and back. A 13 kilometres for a silver mine, the biggest silver mine in New South Wales. No, it's unacceptable. Then you've got what's happening in Jabaluka in the Northern Territory, ERA. Practically had an offer on the table. That's been cancelled. Now I've got another uranium project in South Australia that's having issues as well. So look, the mining sector uh, is the sector in this country and uh, we have to defend it. But instead of defending it, I think we've got to get on the front foot and get on the offensive and start, you know, really standing up for it. So look, thank you for your support. Any companies that you think are... Uh, 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 worthy of this platform, and many are, of course, most are, you know, please, any feedback, love to, uh, love to hear your thoughts. So, uh, Metals X, it's massive, massive project, Tasmania, tin number one performing commodity in 2024, outperformed copper by a country mile, even uranium, so, Brett, please, take the stage, thank you very much. <laughs> Nice to be back in Sydney. I was in Tassie this morning and um, we've only just got power back on down in the mine there. A um, couple of days ago, couldn't even get the guys from the mine back to the camp. So 200 guys stuck at the mine site. Um, no food, no power. Um, grumpy, grumpy change of shift. But they've, they've, got the, they've got the power back on now and it's, uh, it's back, in, back in operation. Um, Tasmania's a bit different. Um, and I say that in a nice way. Um, to, to a lot of mining operations in, in, in other parts of Australia. It does, that area in particular has a long mining history and the little, the little towns around where, um, you know, where Renison is really depend on mining. You know, if, they, if the mines shut down there, the, the, the towns die. Um, there, is, there is pressure from NGOs which affects the operations there. But in general, the community and the government is pretty friendly for, for mining. So I'll, I'll set a bit of context now, so I'll talk a little bit about Metals X. I haven't, I'm not going to talk, um, cautionary statement and disclaimer, you've all read those. Um, Metals X owns 50% of the mine down in Tassie. Um, the other 50% is owned by a joint venture between Yunnan Tin, which is one of the largest tin producers in the world, PRC, um, listed company and another Hong Kong company called Green Tech, which is a tin trading company. Um, having access to that level of technology from a partner who is one of the largest tin producers in the world is pretty valuable for our joint venture. Oh. A bit better? Yeah, yep. right. okay. Small, small board, small company. I'm the only employee of Metals X. Everything else is pushed down into the joint venture where it's paid for 50-50 by the, um, the joint venture partners. Other things we subcontract out. So all our financial services, CFO and everything is, is subbed out. A good experience board, good mix of mining, um, stockbroking and uh, construction experience. So easy to make decisions and easy to get things done. Our, our shareholder base, um, we favour a, ba a shareholder base who understands what our strategy is, which is to be 
uh, a major tin producer and continue to grow uh, tin production. Um, perhaps not the best company for some, but our, our aim is to, um, to use our funds to increase our tin production and have long-term sustainable tin production. We've just um, recommenced the buyback since we put out our results and we've purchased about four and a half million shares back and we'll continue that buyback till we get up to our um, nominated target. Some financial um, highlights, significant amount of cash. Um, tin has been, um, you know, I'm also involved in some gold operations and I say the gold price is hiding a lot of people's sins. The tin price is certainly helping the tin produ producers generate a fair bit of cash and it is, it is allowing interest and investment into people who are trying to develop tin projects. Tin is the metal which is kind of the forgotten um, battery mineral. It's a shame Australia hasn't put it on its critical minerals list. It's put it on a strategic list. A lot of other countries have put it on the um, strategic minerals list. There is, there is a need to, you know, to push the government to reconsider that because we are one of the, one of the, you know, the few tin producers in jurisdictions which are safe and, and clean. Financial, our, stock price, our stock price tends to track the tin price. Um, you can get a pretty good correlation on that. Um, yeah, just, uh, you know, the, we, we, our long-term forecasts for tin, um, we see a supply side shortage. We don't see a number of people being able to bring tin production into the market in the short term. Um, extra capacity coming on in the Congo, but nowhere else in the world is there projects which will be in production in the, in the very near future. A bit of alluvial stuff can come back online in Indonesia, but in Indonesia is complicated. Myanmar, still difficult to tell. Our partner, the Yunnan Tin, are probably the people who understand the most about Myanmar. Um, they're still struggling to get reliable supply out of Myanmar. So supply side shortage, um, even with the downturn in uh, some of the other base commodities, the sort of growing need for electrification and just more and more circuitry and everything should spur an increase in the demand for tin. So we're pretty confident that uh, that tin price is going to remain um, high. As well as our, um, our main investment, which is the Renison mine in Tasmania, um, we, we have a I still have an interest in Cyprium, who we sold the nifty copper mine to. We've just renegotiated the convertible notes there, which I think is a pretty good deal for our shareholders. Our, our strategic view there is it's much better to let Cyprium succeed than it is to try to push them into receivership and call our notes. So we've been working with them to ensure that they have the opportunity to um, get that project into production, because um, that'll be good for our shareholders. Nico, um, we spun off the nickel cobalt and have retained a share ownership in that. Nickel, unfortunately, is suffering because of the production that's come into um, Indonesia. So it'll be a while before the nickel market is is you know buoyant again. But it's a very good deposit, and we continue to we continue to support them. Small investment in a in a gold thing in the Tanami. And then just recently, we bought a major share in, uh, in First Tin. Um, quite excited about First Tin. We looked, you know, I spend most of my time looking for acquisitions. And First Tin to us had the right balance of um, you know, assets, advancement in permitting, and entry price. So that was a, that's a strategic investment for us. And we'll continue to look for other strategic investments to grow our portfolio of, of tin projects. Renison, um, it's the only listed tin producer in Australia, which makes it unique. There aren't a lot of listed tin producers in the world. Being in Australia with its lower political risk than some of the other places is a, is a significant benefit. Um, it's, in a, it's in a pretty good place, in a, even though you know, I'm talking about losing power. The power price in Tasmania is, is very low and the, the, it's almost all renewable. So, you know, our ESG reporting is, is pretty, pretty good and clean. Um, unfortunately, there's no premium for green tin. Um, it's just, just how it goes, yeah? 
significant resource. Um, looking at where it is, it's in an old mining area. Um, I spoke a little bit before about how that area is a, um, it, it's an historic mining town. Um, it's across, I'm not a geologist, but there's a couple of main faults there that have been the sort of fluid conduit up from the granite underneath to bring to the tin up there, and it's been in operation, um, you know, shut down when the tin price fell. It had been starved of investment for a long time. Uh, Metals X has come back in, we refinanced it, um, and are really helping that operation now with significant additional capex and additional money for regional exploration. Creeping um, production, um, getting now above 10,000 tonnes of tin per annum, um, and with the development of the Area 5 um, underground, we should be able to maintain that for the, the majority of the mine life. We've also been quite fortunate in being able to top up the mine life um, every couple of years. So we, we, you know, we would like to see a 10-year rolling mine life out in front of us, producing about 10,000 tonnes of tin from the existing, existing operation. We've, in recent times, we've done, again, the poor mine had been starved of exploration money. Um, in the last couple of years, we've done a fair bit of work looking at the um, near mine exploration. Um, you know, we had the leases, but no one had spent any money drilling it. Um, we, and we've come up with this new area, Ring Rose. Um, it's only 700 metres away from existing underground workings, so it's pretty easy to access from underground, um, and, and very, very good grades. If you look at some of the grades, um, you know, four and a half, um, you know, nearly 30 metres at four and a half, significant intercepts across the whole region. So we'll be doing a fair bit of work now, drilling out this area and bringing it into our, our future mine plans. Again, because it's so close to the existing underground workings, we can get at this from underground with only very limited additional permitting. We'll only need permitting for the disturbances for the vent shafts. So this is, this is a, a major focus for us to get this area further drilled out and then into our, into our mine plans. <coughs> Around Ring Rose, there are a number of other significant areas where we found on the, in the soil sampling um, an indication of significant tin and we're starting a, a sort of major um, regional um, phlegm survey across the region. Uh, followed up by downhole uh, electro electromagnetic surveys as well to, to identify our next drilling targets. Um, this area is full of tin. You know, this, this, the Stella guys are down the road. This area has been historic tin mines for hundreds of years. There's a lot more tin in this region, but it just hasn't been explored. OK, just a little bit more on where we're currently currently drilling there. Um, like to be able to, to, to bring the ring rose area into production in about two years and then we'd like to have another exploration target that we're drilling up and bringing into production following that. These are just the other areas that we're, we're drilling. The, where we're doing the, the major phlegm survey around the edges. And more EM targets. So there's plenty of exploration work and again, sadly, no one had spent any money on exploration there in the last 10 years. They were just drilling, the, the mine was completely starved of capex, which is a real disappointment. More drilling targets, yeah. the geos get all excited. Yeah. Again, more on our, our exploration. Um, the, the, the phlegm surveys have identified huge conductors, but we don't know what they are yet until we, we, we drill them out. They're definitely sulphides, and they're, they're very, very significant, but we'll, we have to spend the money to, to drill them out to actually understand if they, they contain tin. But very prospectus, is, and it's, they're in our existing mining concessions, so there's very little additional work that'll be needed to bring these things into operation. The other thing that's, that's um, been a major focus for us is we have a 
probably 30 years or 40 years of tailings which have as much tin in them as some people are developing as projects. So we've, we, there was a study done um, historically to run this through an ultra-fine grinding, refloat, and then a pyrometallurgical process to recover the tin and the, the copper. That study was crap, but we've redone that now with people who actually understand um, pyrometallurgy and understand flotation. Um, and we've come up with a, a, a new configuration. Um, it'll produce a copper con, and a, um, we've now, just, just this week, looked at splitting the project into two and just building the low-grade concentrator at Renison and then using an existing pyrometallurgical pr um, facility it, at Yunantin rather than building the pyrometallurgical facility in Tasmania. That, that gives us a shortcut to permitting because you're not having to permit, um, you know, um, even though the gas treatment would be clean, to have a stack in the middle of the road that people drive to visit the Tarquine is not, not good for um, the development of a new project. So this will simplify the project significantly. Um, we have an offtake agreement with Yunnan Tin um, to, to take the low-grade concentrate. So this gives us an ability to develop rentals at a faster rate, a much lower capital cost, and an accelerated schedule. It also provides a, um, a model which can be used for other tin tailings in the region. And other tin... Um, there's, we're also looking at... There's some very significant tailing deposits in Bolivia, which, if the rentals works here, can be looked at um, to be developed in a, in a similar flow sheet. It's quite a simple process. It's just ultra-fine grinding, refloat, copper con, tin con, and then sell the tin con to the tin con to China, who put it through one of their existing fumers. Produce approximately seven to eight thousand additional tons of tin a year at about sixty percent of what our present um, costs are, because there's no there's no mining. Approximate schedule. Um, looking at having um, a final investment decision end of next year. The discussions this week have been about whether we continue a traditional feasibility study or now we go straight to a feed and look at accelerating it based on it being a much simpler project just needing the concentrator. But I expect to start um, the NOI process next month and that, that's the, that is likely to be the critical path. Look at our, our, our resources and reserves. Um, again, we've got a 10 year plus mine life and the, with the near mine expiration and the continued um, in mine yeah, expiration, we believe we can continue to top that up so that we maintain a 10 year mine life in front of us. That's the normal common person statement at the end. And that's really Metals X guys, simple strategy. Um, Make a fair bit of cash, use that cash to um, further develop additional tin projects such that we can be one of the largest listed tin producers globally. Yeah. Now we've got time for a couple of questions. We've got them we got now. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Uh, so my question is this. Basically, the tin space has always been a proxy for the semiconductor space. So what would your argument be for why Metal X is going to be a better exposure than Alpha Min? Um, I've worked in the Congo and I've worked in Tasmania. Yeah. <laughs> Very similar? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, they don't speak as much French in the pub in Tasmania. Um, they're, they're completely different. Complete, Alpha, Alpha Min is, honestly, they've got the best tin deposit in the world. You know, they've got the grades. It's just in a, it's in a complicated location. You know, they have to ship up through. They can't even ship out of the Congo. They've got to ship. Congo can be pretty unstable, uh, but it's a very good deposit. And, and they've got a simple flow sheet, so they're, they're lucky. They've got the benefits of very simple metallurgy, 
very high grade deposit, but in a complicated jurisdiction. You know, look at what's happened to some of the other players in the Congo in terms of, look at what's happened to Paul First Quantum, look at the, the others who've suffered. Um, when I was working down in the Congo, it was building a copper mine, the militia came and took all our trucks and committed a massacre. And then came back and gave us the trucks back. Is that Anvil? Yeah. Yeah, well, Yeah. So um, it's, it's, it's got political risk, but it's a bloody good deposit. And it's uh, um, invest in both. If you're bullish on tin, I'd put money into both. Yeah. I mean, you talked about green tin. How can you actually get a premium for green tin? I don't, I don't know if you can because we, we, you know, a lot of the people are producing concentrates that go off to a smelter and to get the green tin you also need the traceability. So to be able to say you'd need the smelters to be batch processing your, your, your tin so that you had the traceability through the smelting process. Not many of the smelters are using significant renewable energy, you know, they, they're, using, they're still using coal and other things. Um, but you know, we're doing with what we're producing. You know, all of our power is is from hydro, um, so we're doing as much as we can. But unfortunately, there just isn't there just isn't a premium for green tin in the market. We don't get one cent more for our concentrate, even though we're making it with 100% renewable energy. One more. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, thank you for taking my question. The um, I, I look at your presentation. You didn't uh, publish the uh, revenue, so I'm just wondering, what's the uh, what's the uh, your production? What's the uh, gross margin now? And also, my second question is the uh, uh, what is your customer base? Is that 100% export to China? Or? No, um, well, customer base question. We just put out our um, half yearly, so you can have a look at our revenues and things in the half yearly. That's up on the our last ASX announcement. The um, our, we sell um, our tin to to the smelters in Thailand and Malaysia and China. We've just reached, each year we renew our offtake agreements. The smelter in Thailand wasn't very flexible this year, so we've reallocated their tin to Yunnan Tin. But strategically, we think it's important to have more than one customer. So we're selling our tin to the smelters in Malaysia and to Yunnan Tin. Sorry, just one more question. I look at also you accumulated like quite a bit of cash, $180 million, and you have no debt. So what is going to be the, uh, the impact on your future uh, shareholder return? Uh, are you going to be in increasing your uh, dividend? Thank you. Yep, okay. um, when, we have, um, f when we have franking credits, we'll relook at their dividend policy. At the moment, we still have um, at least a year, maybe a year and a half, accumulated tax losses. We are doing a buyback at the moment, which is a, a sort of de facto return to our shareholders. Um, and we will use that money to develop the Rentals project and to invest in strategic tin projects like we've done in uh, First Tin. OK? Thanks, everybody. Cheers. Cheers. Hey, just a little bit of trivia on tin. So 50% of the world's tin supplies used for solder. Obviously, it used to be lead solder, but that was outlawed uh, by the United Nations in 2002. And just to give you an idea of the grade, so something like 30-40% of the world's tin is plus a mining alluvial. And in Indonesia and Burma, we're talking 300 part per million, it's that low, and they're running profitable mining projects. These guys here in Tasmania, and it's very similar in Taronga, uh, which we'll hear from, uh, uh, from, from first, first Tin in New South Wales, they're running 15,000 part per million. These are obviously hard rock deposits, but this is, this is the significance of the grades. So... Simon from Stella, please. Next door neighbours, the first tin. Uh, excuse me, the metals X. Welcome. Great, thanks very much. Great to be here again at the uh, Sydney Mining Club. Thanks to the sponsors and um, and the invitation to speak. And great to be here with uh, first tin and, and metals X. Um, Stella's been around for a while. I think. 10, 12 years. Um, I think they picked up this project about 10 years ago. Uh, and like Brett said, it's, it's probably been starved of, uh, with their exploration, this has been starved of capital to actually advance the project. Um, but we've had a, a really transformational la last 
six to eight months. Um, we've attracted some good investment. We've completely refigured, reconfigured our board, and I'll run through that sh shortly. And as of this week, we just announced a, a, a scoping study which will take us into our, our pre-feasibility pre work. So it's, it's been a, an exciting time for us. Just the disclaimers. Um, we're obviously West Tasmania, fantastic place to be working. We, we own 100% of the Heemskirk tin, tin project. Um, it's the highest grade undeveloped uh, tin project in Australia and, and, and third globally. Um, great infrastructure. Um, this is a mining area. I've, I've been working in um, West Africa for the last seven years and going from West Africa to Tasmania is, is, is a joy. Um, it's, there's so much you know, infrastructure. They're welcoming. We've been in and seen the EPA. We've been in to see the mines department. Um, and it's, it's a really, really great place to be working. It's amazing how many instos have approached me about site visits, knowing Barn Bugle Golf Course is just up the road. Um, that didn't happen when we were working in Mali. There was no, um, no one wanting to come over except for a couple of people wanting to go to Paris. But uh, look, a great place to be working. I was surprised how mining friendly it is there when we first went down there. Um, the town's supportive, um, the people are supportive and, um, and we, really like, we really like working there. Um, as I said, we've just put out a scoping study which I'll run through shortly. We've started our pre-feasibility study um, we've got two rigs going at the moment. We're completing a nine and a half thousand um, metre drill program, which is a combination of up updating our resource, uh, extending the, 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 the resource, but also having all those inputs that we can put into the feasibility work, sampling for ore sorting and for metallurgy, etc. Uh, as I said, we're well funded. We've got um, about $12.3 million in the bank. Uh, and we're really well positioned to capitalise on um, the looming tin shortage and, 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 and moving forward on, on our project. Just quickly on, on the board, um, uh, as I said, we've reconfigured the board over the last six to eight months. Uh, I stepped into an executive role about uh, six months ago and brought on um, Andrew Boyd, who's, who's here today. Um, Andrew and I work closely uh, on a company called Oclo Resources for the last seven years in Africa. Um, we, went, we went to Mali, we found just under a million ounces of gold and then we sold it to um, B2 Gold in September 22. Um, and having seen this asset and getting involved in this asset, we're excited to, to move this one forward. Um, we've got some good investors have come on, Nero Resource Fund, uh, about 15% of us in Paradise and Regal. And, and the money we've got now will really put us in good stead to do all our feasibility work over the next uh, 12 to 24 months. Um, and it's great paying uh, drillers in Aussie, Aussie dollars instead of US dollars like we were doing in Africa. So the, the dollars go a lot further in, in, in this part of the world with, with our exploration. Just location wise, um, Brett was talking about Renison there just up the road, about 18 kilometres. Uh, you can see there up to the northeast of us. Um, and a the Avery nickel mine is, is, is to the west of us, about eight kilometres. That's c currently in administration and, and, and about to go into care and maintenance. There's a, so there's lots of infrastructure and mills around us. We've got options, uh, either standalone, toll treating, but, and we'll investigate all those options as we move forward. The project itself, you can see in the circle there, there's, there's uh, Severn, Queen Hill, um, Unar and Montana. They're the, they're, the, they're the tin deposits. There's about five of them there. All we're really focusing on is the main two, which, which is Severn and Queen Hill at this stage, and that's where we've just put the scoping, scoping numbers out from. Um, growth potential here is, is, is really excites us. Uh, there has been very little uh, geological modelling and very little geophysics done on, on the projects where, where part of this drilling program will be to, to, to set up some platforms for downhole EM, which has worked very well for, for ring rows, for metals X. Uh, been, we're pulling together a geological model at the moment um, and you know you can look at the, the Renison mine, you know, 1968 they had a four million tonne reserve and a five year mine life and 50 years later it's, it's still going and, and got at least another 10 to 15 years ahead of it. So this is one of the world class tin provinces. We've got the granite sitting under, under this area, very similar geology um, and uh, I'm sure there's going to be a lot more tin found in this region. In, in, the, in this region. 
Uh, low environmental impact. This will be a, a, a small underground mine, low footprint, 100% um, uh, renewable energy, and energy costs for us in our scoping study is about 18% of our, of our costs, and um, we can literally tap into a power source. We can see the, the transmission line which runs over the hill to the Avery, Avery mine, and it's, uh, it, we can easily tap into power, and which, which, which is great. So the, the resource itself, um, the headline there, just under 80,000 tonnes of contained tin at uh, just over a percent. Um, just under half of that is in the, in the indicated category, which is what we've put into the, into the scoping study. Um, all the deposits are open at depth and a long strike, and um, you know, we're excited about, as I said, putting the models together, um, understanding why the deposits are there, and, and also doing some downhole work. So our mission over the next um, six to 12 months is to convert a lot of that inferred material. There's about 40,000 tonnes of inferred material, there, sorry, 40,000 tonnes of contained tin of um, uh, material into, into indicated from the drilling. Um, and obviously that will you know, aid in our, in our, in our pre-feasibility work. Um, it ranks us, as I said, uh, globally uh, about the third highest uh, grade project in, 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 in the world and obviously we'll, we'll be looking to move that circle to the right and up uh, with the drilling that we're going to be doing. Um, we're watching things like South Crofty in Cornwall and, and what they're doing and um, First Tin and etc and it's ex really exciting time to be in tin. Um, it's, it's performed well and I think it will continue to form well over, over the coming years. So here's our um, snapshot of our scoping study, which we put out this week. Uh, as I said, 97% uh, of it is, is in the indicated category. Um, the image on the right there is the, is the plan, conceptual mine. All of those red areas is the indic indicated material, and all the yellow areas weren't included in the, in the scoping, which is all the inferred material. Um, we did a base case at $28,000 US a tonne tin, um, gave us a 12-year mine life. Uh, and producing just over 22,000 tonnes of uh, tin and concentrate. Uh, low capex, as I said, power and everything is, is easy for us there. Um, we've got a pre-tax MPV of about 122 uh, at an 8% discount, and, and, the, and you can see the IRR. And importantly is, is the life of mine um, all in sustaining costs. So that is um, a sold product. It includes everything at mining, processing, um, trucking to Burnie, the concentrate to Burnie, putting it on a boat, uh, and an 8% fee also in, on top included in that for, for smelting. So it's, it's a competitive and, and uh, cost. It's, you can see the, the numbers there on, on where tin is. And we did a, a, a base, uh, sorry, a spot price at, at 32,000, just to give you an idea of where the, the MP will get to, and that's about 190 million there with a, with a nice RR of, of 46%. Um, the layout here, I've, I've put this in here to show you that image on the right. The top of, top of the hill there is, it, that's the Queen Hill, where the, where the Queen Hill uh, all body daylights. You can see the scratchings on the surface there. A lot of that work was done in the 1890s, 1900s, when they were mining the silver lead zinc out of the top of these systems. Um, and obviously they, they couldn't treat the tin back then. Um, the, the process plant you can see there, you can see the Trial Harbour Road that goes right past right past the project, that heads down to, to the Avery mine, um, down to the south. But the beauty here is the town of Zeehan sits uh, in that top right corner, so the process plant and the waste pile, etc., will sit uh, hidden from town, um, and, and which, is, which is great. And we've been in seeing the EPA, etc. We've started all of our baseline environmental work again. There's been a lot of baseline work done here in the past, but we're redoing all of that at the moment, all the studies are being redone, and we're hoping to lodge our, our notice of intent as at the same time that we get the pre-feasibility out, which will be uh, in the first half, second, sorry, early in the second half of next year, and at that stage we'll, we'll have all that baseline work. We've, we've started the work about a month ago. So low, low environmental impact here, um, on-site processing, tailage stories, etc., uh, and, um, and obviously working through 
working through all those studies with the, with the pre-feasibility work. So the upside potential, um, mining rate, we've, we've, in, if you have a look at the study, we put, we put out uh, that the, the study showed that we could actually sustain a, um, a mining rate up around 600, 700,000 tonnes per annum. Uh, we've put the study out showing the 350 at this stage. And the reason we've done that is we, we want to look at ore sorting, which ha is not included in this, in this scoping work. And we know the ore sorting works really well at Renison. Um, we know that multiple uh, tin companies around the world are, are using ore sorting to upgrade their material. And I'll show you a slide shortly on the, the, the early stage ore sorting work that was done here in 2017, 2018. But if we can, if we can get ore sorting to work and, and mine at a, a faster rate, put it through the ore sorter and then build a smaller plant, um, it's, it's going to have a lot of benefits for that NPV as we move forward. So we're optimising that work. Part of this drilling we're doing will be collecting enough core particularly from the Severn, uh, sorry, from the Queen Hill deposit uh, to do that work. A lot of the drilling in the last couple of years has been from Severn. We've got enough core to do the work from there. And you can see that image on the right there is, you know, the, the inferred material on the top of that, on, on, the, on, the, on the left there, converting that into, into an indicated as we move forward. Uh, we're well leveraged to the tin price, as, as is shown in the tin price sensitivity uh, chart at the bottom there. Um, and this project will make money in really good cycles, it'll make a lot of money, and in bad cycles it'll still, it'll still be making money. So just on the ore sorting, this was work that was done 2017-2018. Uh, there hasn't been an, enough of it done to include in the, in the scoping. This was a few samples that were, were done at Severn, um, where they put in a 1.3% you know, uh, sample. Uh, they got rid of 57% you know, of, of the waste, uh, upgraded the grade there, you can see, and got a, got a um, tin recovery of about 87%. So, um, you know, that's why we want to do this ore sorting. If we can get rid of, you know, 30, 40% of the waste and not have to put that through the mill, obviously we can build a, a smaller plant and, and, and mine, at a, mine at a quicker rate. So all of that work's going to be done um, in the next 6 to 12 months. Just a snapshot, a, a, a long section of Severn. Why, why do we think we can grow the resource? You can see the in, inside that black line on the right-hand side is all of the indicated material, uh, and outside of that is the inferred material. So you can see it's open at depth. You can see those blocks there are 100 metres. So there's you know, very little drilling at depth and, and, and uh, a long strike from the, from the ore body. We're now targeting some of those zones with our drilling, with our, with our rigs on site. And we'll also be doing uh, downhole EM once we've got some platforms on the, on, the, on the outsides of the ore body. And you can see the grades there and some of the drilling we've hit uh, in, in the last program before we stopped drilling to put the scoping together. Um, and I can't stress enough again about doing geophysics and, and, and putting this geological model together. We're, we're excited about what we're seeing, seeing in, in that study already. Um, there are the rigs on a nice day in Tasmania. I think, it was, I think it was raining just before then. I was actually at the snow last week and there was no snow there, so I think it's all down on the, on the hills in Tasmania. Um, this, is, this is the program we're doing, 24 holes, 9,500 metres, and as I said, a lot of it will be used for, for the pre-feeds, geotechnical, hydrological inputs, um, extending the mineralisation and, and, and the, and the downhole. And we hope to uh, have the drilling done uh, in the next six months. We might bring in a third rig. Um, only one of the downsizes in working where we are is, is not being, they don't like working weekends, so we'll, we might bring a, a rig in. It's a bit more civilised than we were working in Winter Africa, which was 24-7, but um, we might bring another rig in here to, to, to increase the, the meterage. So our pathway, uh, you can see there, as I said, we completely re reconfigured our board. Uh, we've attracted some really good funding from some good investors. Uh, we've, we've put out our scoping study and our aim is to have our pre-feasibility study out early in the second half of, of next year. Um, Brett touched on this earlier, but just a couple of quick slides on tin. Um, you know, it, it was smarter people than me have commented that it's, you know, it was the n number one metal uh, most impacted by new technology 
as Will said, 50% of it goes into solar. So everything you've got, your phones, your washing machines, your, your cars, everything electrical has tin in it. And there is a, a growing demand and, uh, and a, uh, the supply side is really being threatened by um, where it's produced in, in parts of the world, um, which is this slide here. You can see uh, you know, global, global concentrate production is about 300,000 tonnes per annum. Of that, about 70% of the world's tin comes out of you know, unreli unreliable jurisdictions. China, Indonesia, Myanmar, Peru. Um, they banned tin mining in, in Myanmar Wa State in 23, uh, and they've banned all unrefined tin exports in 23 out of, out of Indonesia. That makes up 34% of the world's tin supply. It's slowly coming back on stream, um, but as Brett said, we, we've also scanned the world and we can't see you know, another, another big, big project coming on in the near term. Um, we were up at the Malaysian, in Malaysia a little while ago at the International um, Tin Conference, and there was also you know, no talk of you know, something coming on and swamping the market. Um, Alphamin, yes, is a fantastic project, 4% tin. Uh, but it is also in, a, in an unreliable jurisdiction. Um, so we're, we're excited about the prospects for tin and where it's going. Um, and the bottom line is we've got a project already with a really compelling all-in sustaining cost, as, as I mentioned, of about $18,000 US. And uh, look, that's pretty much it. That's the summary we've been through. Uh, we're looking forward to continuing to drill and, 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 and do the work well and get it done. Um, we're looking forward to taking any investors to Barnboogle. If you do play golf, you can come and come and have a visit. Um, and uh, yeah, looking forward to uh, getting on getting on with the work. And thanks again for having us. Now, I think we've got time for two questions. Evening. Thanks for your talk. Uh, ben from Gecko Systems. Come from uh, Melbourne to saw a triple header of tin, and I right. didn't, didn't want to miss it. Um, having worked on ore sorters and ore sorting at Renison for a few years, um, you're very brave to bring up minerals processing in this kind of environment. I've never heard people talk about minerals processing before, but um, are you uh, considering what to do with all the fine material that generally bypasses an ore sorting circuit? And yeah. how leveraged is your project to ore sorting working for you versus uh, conventional processing? Yeah, so the, the scoping study you, you saw has no ore sorting in it at all. So we haven't, we ha we haven't included it in, in, in all. So as I said, there wasn't enough work done in 2017, 2018. Yeah. Um, so that's a base case we're at today. Going forward, we're going to look at all sorting. Um, all upside then? All upside. So if, we, if it doesn't work at all, that's, that's the base case, it works. If it works, if we can get it to work 20%, 30%, 40%, I'm not a metallurgist, but we've seen from the early work that it works. Uh, we're in the same geological environment as Renison. It's, you know, the, we know that there's, there's a good chance that we can, we can get, some, get, some, get it to work. On the fines, look, that'll all come out in our network as well. We're using company called Minasyst who did a lot of the work on this area. They're out of Melbourne actually. Uh, did a lot of work on, on, the, on the early met here. We're using them uh, to, to, to look at the fines, etc. So we'll, we'll have all that for the, for the feasibility. But there's no all sorting yet in that scoping study. Thanks. Anyone else? One more? No, I don't think so. Great. Thank you, Simon. Okay, thank Appreciate you. It. Now, I just want to clarify that we're not the Hobart Mining Club, we're the Sydney Mining Club. So we've had two Tasmanian companies. We've now got a New South Wales company here up in Taronga near Glen Innes and in Viril. So, Tony, please, thank you. First tin. Thanks for that introduction. Can you see me over there, Lecton? <laughs> um, so... Uh, I started my career in, in tin back in the early 80s when tin was still worth something. 
and uh, was involved in drilling out the Collingwood Tim project in North Queensland. Um, so a few years after that, the Tim, Tim price absolutely tanked and um, nobody looked at Tim for 20 years, so I went into gold. So um, I started in tin and hope back in tin now, hopefully uh, we'll see this through to, uh, to the end. So I suppose, um, first off, uh, you guys are probably wondering why a company like Metals X uh, would invest in us. Well, look, I can't speak for, for Metals X and Brett's already given you some take on that, but I can tell you about our key project, Taronga. So it's low risk, low cost, low capex, low tech, uh, as well as being scalable. So to, in my mind, it's the simplest tin deposit in the world, apart from an alluvial deposit. Uh, it's an open pit. It has a strip ratio of around about one to one. It has the simplest mineralogy you could ever find. Um, and in tin, we believe mineralogy is king. Um, we've already got uh, a DFS, which I'll uh, talk about shortly. Uh, we expect the environmental impact study to be lodged uh, around about the end of this year. Um, and uh, just uh, moving on to the uh, reason we think it's so simple, you can see that that rock just breaks along the, the vein where the tin is and exposes the, the, the tin very quickly. So the normal disclaimer. So key messages uh, to take away today, I think uh, uh, the top, the picture on the top left hand corner is, is very old and uh, everybody's seen it before. But the reason I'll put it up there is we see this is now being borne out. So the three key messages, first um, structural change uh, related to demand growth and constrained supply, uh, driving TIN's importance globally. Second, meeting the growing needs uh, for TIN um, is not just from uh, supply, but it's from supply from stable jurisdictions uh, that will give manufacturers supply chain security. And third, uh, our projects are, we believe, the most advanced undeveloped TIN projects in the world. Uh, we meet supply chain security and compliance needs, being in Germany and Australia. Uh, we're low cost, low tech, low capex, low risk, and we provide a large and growing resource base. So we've, uh, the past, previous two speakers have spoken a little bit about the, uh, the tin story, so I'll run through these very quickly. So on the left-hand side, you can see the forecast from uh, the International Tin Association, which suggests tin demand will approach about half a million tonnes by 2030. Uh, you can see that that's from a whole range of uh, source, uh, sources so, uh, and applications. Uh, but while demand growth is strong, the pipeline for new tin projects is very slim, as touched on by previous speakers. So you can see that on the right-hand chart. Even if all these projects were delivered, it would only provide about 35% of the anticipated demand growth. So that, of course, leads to uh, a supply-demand um, inequality, and, um, and in, uh, obviously to uh, fill that, there will be an increase in, in the tin price going forward. So moving on to our main project, uh, Taronga. So the world needs new tin supply. Uh, first tin, we have a resource base of nearly 310,000 ounces, oh sorry, tonnes, <laughs> going back to gold, 310,000 tonnes of contained tin. And as far as we know, that's the fourth largest portfolio of undeveloped tin resources. So the projects are located in favourable jurisdictions, Australia and Germany, uh, which is important for supply chain security, um, traceability and compliance. So Taronga is located in northern New South Wales, in between Glen Innes and Tenterfield, up along the New England Highway. 
Uh, we've got 138,000 tonnes of uh, contained tin in Jork resources, uh, including 52,000 tonnes in proven and probable reserves, and we are growing both of those. In Saxony, in Germany, we've got another 138,000 tonnes of contained tin at Tellerhauser and a further 33,000 tonnes uh, at our Gottesberg project. The Tellerhauser project is also polymetallic and has significant magnetite, zinc, silver and indium credits. So we see Taronga as being the world's next new tin mine um, and for very good reasons. A definitive feasibility study confirms that it will be a highly attractive, low capex, low cost, low risk, high margin mine. Uh, the geology is given as a very large resource base in a mineralogically simple coarse-grained ore body amenable to low-cost open-pit mining with a very low strip ratio and easy grade control. Simple mineralogy means the tin occurs as coarse-grained cassiterite in narrow quartz veins uh, with a low rock strength, as you saw in that video before. So with the host rock is a very tough horn fells uh, contains no tin at all. So natural fracturing along the quartz veins enables very rapid liberation of this coarse cassiterite and subsequent rapid volume reduction and grade enhancement using very basic crushing and gravity technologies. So Taronga is also located in a historic tin mining district in northern New South Wales which lowers our permitting risk. Uh, we've already received water rights allocations and clearances with respect to native title. And uh, we've submitted our scoping report and we obtained uh, SEERS on Monday this week. So for those of you who don't know, SEERS is Secretary's Environmental Requirements, uh, uh, Environmental Assessment Requirements. So uh, get, coming on to our recent feasibility study. Um, so the natural endowments um, make this a very highly attractive uh, uh, value creation situation. So starting on the left, the pre-tax MPV at a tin price of 30,000 US is 243 million Aussie um, with a very good IRR. So, but, yeah, that was the base case. We see considerable upside uh, moving forward from that, from low-hanging low fruit. So recovery improvements and uh, conversion of inferred resources within the uh, current pit uh, design will bring up uh, the optimised MPV to about 345 million Aussie. And further upside from infill and extension drilling will add to mine life and improve the economics even further. So finally, the project is uh, very leveraged to high tin prices. At 40,000 US dollars, we add another 260 million to the MPV. So potentially looking at a, at a plus $600 million uh, MPV situation. Uh, beyond that, we also have brownfield expansions and satellite deposits and also potential to add a fine uh, tin circuit down the track. So this slide slows, uh, that shows that we've got a very uh, competitive cost base due to the simple open pit mining, low strip ratio and simple processing. So C1 cost is looking around about $12,000 US and all in sustaining costs around about 15800 uh, total costs, including all the uh, capital, is, uh, takes us up to still less than 20,000 US dollars. So around the current spot price, cash margin for more than sustaining costs is around about 52%. So there are a few competitor comparisons on the right side, and you can see that we're close to the lower quartile for all in sustaining and cash costs. So at these costs, we're going to generate a lot of cash. So we've got very favourable geology and uh, uh, low strip ratios, I'll keep mentioning. Uh, but Taronga mineralisation is wide, so up to 200 metres wide. It's continuous, still open in just about all directions. 
benefits from that low strip ratio, as you can see on the cross section there. Basically, you're half that the 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 pit there is um, is all, and that topography is not exaggerated. It's very very steep country out there, which really helps with the strip ratio. And uh, because we're an English company, I'll put the Tower of Big Ben there for scale. So, um, again, you know, mineralogy, we believe, is king. Uh, we've got very coarse cassiterite. Uh, the average size of cassiterite's um, uh, between one and two millimetres. Um, it's hosted in very coarse quartz, uh, sorry, it's hosted in quartz veins that have a much lower rock strength than the Hornfels host rock. You can see on the photo on the left, the quartz vein, the black crystals, you can see they're of course cassiterite. And these veins have a, a much lower rock strength. I'll just uh, reinforce that by showing this little video again. And uh, you can see that it breaks right along those veins, exposes the softer cassiterite containing material which then upgrades very simply using simple gravity processing. So this is a very simplistic uh, look at our, our flow sheet. Um, so you can see it's simple, low cost, uh, comprising <coughs> crushing. Uh, we, what we do, we crush to 12 millimetres, then screen at uh, 2.8 millimetres, and all the oversize gets thrown away at that stage and we retain the minus 2.8 millimetre fraction, which contains between 85 and 95% of the tin. Uh, then we were on to just simple jigs, cyclones, uh, spirals, regrown ball mill, screens and tables. All basic kit, which is inexpensive uh, on capex and on opex. So these basic concentration processes rapidly reduce the volume and increase the grade. So by the end of the uh, the, t the tables, we've got a pre-concentrate of around 20,000 tonnes uh, upgraded to 15 to 20% tin, compared with 5 million tonnes that we started with. The final sulphide float and dressing facility is very small, and that produces a, a concentrate of around about uh, 5,000 tonnes per year at over 60% tin. So, but, uh, yeah, the steak knives, that's not all. Uh, we don't see Taronga as a one-off, but rather it's part of a regional tin district. So there are three main tin districts in northern New South Wales that we call the New England Tin Corridor. So Taronga lies within the historic Emmerville field, and the map on the left hand shows the extensive coverage we've got under exploration licence there. Sorry. Sorry. So you can see the, uh, the, the tin corridor in, uh, in yellow there and the, the three main tin districts. So we've got about 558 square kilometres of ground under exploration licence, which covers almost all of the tin occurrences around Emmerville. So we've done soil and rock chip sampling and a, a bit of minor drilling on some of the regional targets, uh, which show very similar characteristics to Taronga itself. So we, we see very, very good potential uh, for a longer term hub and spoke um, system developed around the Taronga processing plant. So the map on the right hand side shows uh, another one of these tin districts, Tinga, which we recently uh, picked up about um, 277 square kilometres uh, of ground and very early stage exploration for us, basically no drilling, deep drilling in this area and uh, we, we see their uh, potential for another Taronga-style target there. So finally, a few brief comments on the value that resides in our Tellerhauser and Gottesberg projects in Germany. In contrast to Taronga, Tellerhauser will be an underground mine, but the higher grade, combined with zinc, indium and magnetite byproducts, helps offset those higher costs and complexity of underground mining. It's also part of a historic tin district for which we have exploration licences at the nearby Gottesberg, Breitenbroom and uh, Arisberg projects. So in the bottom right, you can see the potential uh, from some of our recent drilling results 
uh, with that uh, the one at Gottesburg there, the top one being a, a standout. So uh, to conclude, I'll just run through our investment case. So first tins listed in London and Frankfurt and has 100% ownership of two exceptional tin projects in Australia and Germany. It's located in historic mining areas, close to existing infrastructure, and they're all low tech, low risk, low capex and low opex. They have scale with established reserves and resources and we're progressing through permitting at, at all those projects. Tronga, in my mind, is the most unique tin opportunity in the world based on the simple low cost open pit mining and the one to one strip ratio, the simple mineralogy, which allows a simple low cost gravity based flow sheet. We aren't looking at a fine tin circuit at all at this stage, uh, but there's potential to add that down the track. And uh, we've got excellent upgrading by simply crushing to 12 millimetres and uh, uh, screening at 2.8. The DFS shows we've got very attractive economics and significant upside potential and leverage to higher tin prices. We believe the outlook to the tin market is positive due to the structural shifts underway, the forecast deficits, and with tin recognised as critical and strategic metals in, in many countries. So the genesis of first tin 10 years ago was to get ready for uh, these uh, shifts and we now feel that we're very well positioned uh, to take advantage. As shown on the simple graph on the right of the page, portfolio of existing projects, satellite deposits and the Tinga field means that we've got a, a good growth uh, uh, potential. Thanks for listening. Uh, this concludes the presentation, and just to uh, reinforce it once again, <laughs> simple mineralogy. Uh, any, any quick questions? Ah. That's exactly right. Um, thank you. Uh, have you done any sensitivity analysis on the 8% discount rate that you've actually put on those slides? So, sorry. Could have you done some sensitivity and analysis on the 8% discount rate that you put on those slides for a brand new mine in New South Wales? Uh, yes. Yes, we have. I, I don't have the numbers offhand, but they were published uh, as part of the um, uh, DFS, uh, which you can get off our website. Still make money? Yes. Perfect. Uh, uh, Taronga is our lead project. Um, it's our most important project. What are you doing it, in Germany then, and why bother? We, we started off in Germany, and uh, Germany is still very attractive as a, as a follow-on project. We've, we're focusing... Wouldn't you be better doing one project rather than two? We, we're basically focusing on Taronga at the moment. Germany's going through... Um, uh, basically permitting, so that very little money is being spent on that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Th thanks, Brett. You said that much better than I could. <laughs> that right. Hey, just a shout out to Sky Metals as well. Talabang, that's the other big project near Condobble. And, and just credit to the City Mining Club tonight and, and all, all the work Julian does. We've had, I mean, these are the three biggest tin projects in Australia. So thank you all to the speakers. And uh, I'll now hand it over to Julian. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>
I just get to do the nice part, which is to hand out some special gifts. Um, but a funny story, I remember years ago, do you know what, uh, Brett, you might know, when did the, what was the second opening of the Mount Lyle mine? Was it like 98 or somewhere around there? Yeah, I got invited down as a guest of honour because um, Hamish Bohannon was a mate of mine and he thought he'd just fud push me onto the, I was a writer and a journalist and put me on with all, all the, the, the important people on a big table and uh, it was funny, when I sat down there was, uh, I asked around the table what, and I didn't recognise anybody, and, but I was sitting with the, um, the, the Premier-elect, the current Premier and a past Premier and I didn't recognise any of them because, <laughs> because I was in Tasmania and we don't know a lot about Tasmania. But they, uh, they had a, um, the other great thing they did, which was well, the last great mine opening I can re remember going to because it was, we had Trevor Sykes, we had Geoffrey Blaney who wrote The Peaks of Lyle and um, all of these great characters. And they actually had a, um, a train ride. They owned the Emu Bay train line also, which ran all the way from Mount Lyle all the way down to Burnie. So they owned the whole train line. It was 160 kilometres or something like that. And, um, and, and, and for a treat for all the guests, they, um, they, they had a band playing. And then all the guests, um, uh, they had a concentrate train with, car with passenger carriages in front of it. And we all got onto the to, onto the train, and everyone was drinking like crazy, you know. And um, the, and this band was playing, and uh, and I can remember one of the this uh, prominent um, uh, politician down there, Schultz was his surname. And I remember him at one stage, things were so out of hand. He was he had his shirt off, and he was doing big belly belly crawls with his <laughs> tummy in front of everybody to just to amuse them. It was completely off off the off the planet, and the. Um, and then as we went down to Burnie, they, um, they actually stopped the train for a piss stop and everybody would then stop, they'd stop the train and everyone would get off on the siding and the band would play and there'd be some people dancing and get, climb back on again and off we went to Burnie again all the way. But uh, that, was the, the, that was the second great opening of the, of the Mount Lyle um, <clears throat> uh, copper mine, which, um, which then, you know, closed again some years later. But... Um, it was a, 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 a great, great memory and um, a good thing to uh, had a, I just had that great Tasmanian quality about it that somehow or other. Now, uh, gentlemen, I've, we have some. Um, Will, would you mind just giving me a hand um, for a moment? Um, you may not know this, but it's, this is a traditional gift of the Sydney Mining Club. The members will know. Uh, but we, um, we've had these uh, Eureka flags um, made from an original design in, a, in an all-weather um, fabric, you know, the long-lasting all-weather fabric, so probably pretty good in four and a half metres of rain too. Um, and uh, so that we have the Eureka flag for you, each of you, and they're very nice. They're in this, um, you know, very, very high-tech uh, fabric, proper, the proper article, and we have them made specially to, for... Um, as our gift, and they are they are long lasting, very valuable. We regard them as not as the CFMEU exist anymore. Don't think so. Um, <laughs> it's not their flag at all. They weren't. <laughs> it was miners who died under this flag, and um, we so we give it with great significance. It is a if anything, it's the the flag of the people because it was where government got too big for its boots, and it it. It, it oppressed people who were going into, into enterprise very much as we are and uh, in giving their efforts and it, it, uh, it taxed them horribly and the, the, the situation escalated and then lo and behold on a Sunday morning the, the government snuck up and, and killed its own people which was a, a terrible thing but uh, uh, it led to our new constitution for the people that there actually became uh, assisted in the writing of our constitution. It's a very important event. So uh, we, we regard it as the miner's flag and the people's flag. Nothing to do with the CFUMEU and nothing to do, it gets a little bit conflated with the, the rebel flag in the United States, which is uh, essentially has racist connotations, you know. We don't have any of that here. This is just uh, a good old miner's flag. So we've had them made, we give them with, um, they, are, they are a beautiful article. I'd just like you to each come up and um, receive um, one of, oh, there's also a Sydney Mining Club jumper, so. Uh, yeah, please, please come up one by one and all together, all together, come on.